Ordinance of 1785. Uh, there was a slide I put up at the very end which showed railroad tracks and, uh, and a freeway interchange. And um, I pointed out that that was the logic, the geometric logic of that really had to do with the physics of how you turn something traveling 50 or 60 miles an hour that weighs several tons. Um, in other words, it's, 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 um, it's subject to its own logic. Okay. And I think uh, as the 19th century comes to a close and the 20th century begins, we see more and more of that creeping into the logic of cities, of design, of architecture, of all kinds of things, often in the guise of uh, function. Um, I mean, no matter what else, you have to, if it's an airplane, you have to have a certain amount of runway to land safely, right? That's fundamental. And if you cannot do that, then you can't have an airport, right? And if you can't have an airport, you can't have air transport. Um, so there's a certain logic to this which is uh, subject to its own, to the physics, really, of the thing that you're dealing with. Often, though, uh, the physics of the thing becomes a kind of a footnote that props up some larger agenda that, um, remind me, in one hour. Um, and that's what we head into in the early decades of the 20th century, where uh, cities are growing in the wake of the Industrial Revolution very rapidly in the industrialized parts of the world. And, um, and so there are all sorts of theories that develop on how to make cities better. Um, some of which have to do with the principles of the Congress of International Architect Moderne, CIM, or known as CM, um, which is really the sort of explication of Le Corbusier's Ville Radieuse, the Radiant City. Um, so today um, we will talk about um, Chief among these is the ad of, of these technological changes that will impact cities probably about as much as anything um, in history is the arrival of the automobile. Um, it's, um, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, it's hard for us to imagine that in 1840, no human being had ever traveled 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour. Now, how fast does how fast does an airplane fly, Kathy? Uh, yeah, 400, 500 miles an hour? 500 something miles an hour. Um, you just think about that and, um, and, and it's astonishing. I mean, actually, even in, 18, in the 1830s, they weren't sure what was going to happen to a person moving that fast. They, they thought you might actually come flying apart, that you, you would explode. Um, traveling 60 miles an hour, you do it all the time when you're going to the airport at 3 in the morning. Um, it's pretty hard to go 60 miles an hour, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on this traffic out here. And, but um, So what we're coming into is, is this period. Now, I want to play a little video here. And one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to do is to embed a YouTube video in a PowerPoint presentation. There must be 8,572 web pages telling you how to do that. I've been through 8,463 of them, and none of them work. But um, we're going to give it our best here, even if I have to copy and paste. It's up, so we'll see. This is a trip down Market Street in San Francisco in 1906. Someone um, attached a camera. Of course, motion pictures were brand new at this point. Um, someone attached a camera to the front of a streetcar. And I want to just um, watch a little bit of this, maybe two minutes of it, three minutes of it, and then ask you a question.
Don't think we need that. Dave's hot and juicy triple. <laughs> Let me see if we can get this back to where it's supposed to be. Um, I want this video right here. Portobello mushroom burger. <laughs> oh, come on. Just won't that won't let that advertisement go, will it? Okay, this is Market Street, San Francisco, 1906. And the question I'm going to ask you is, what is the primary thing you notice here? Huh? It's not working over there, is it? Supposed to be a laptop. There we go. Sorry? Huh? Disjointed? No rules. Very good, yes. That's right. That's right. There are no rules. There are no traffic. There's no stop signs, no, no traffic lights, no pedestrian crossings, nothing, right? It's just everything that can be in the street is in the street, and there are no rules, and there's nothing to regulate conflicts between automobiles and pedestrians. Um, when the Ville Radius was written, uh, it was before we had basic um, sort of rules about traffic signaling like we do now. I mean, you will go after this class to this intersection, and if you're smart, you will wait for the light to change, and you will then cross the street. If you're not so smart, you will attempt to beat the oncoming traffic and then say a prayer when you get to the other side thanking you, thanking the, the Almighty that you made it safely. Uh, here, there no, there's nothing. You just... Um, move down the street. This is headed down toward the ferry terminal, by the way. And it goes on. This goes on for about 10 minutes. But the point was that. The point was there are no sort of traffic signals, no rules. This is before any of that came into being. And because of that, the conflicts between pedestrians and automobiles, um, vehicles, uh, was substantial. People were hit frequently. And um, so there was great consternation, again, sort of in the realm of public health, if you think about it, that really had to do with trying to rationalize uh, the flow of traffic. Right, the flow of traffic. And uh, we see that here in um, La Ville Radius. And if you wonder why uh, I lumped the invention of landscape into um, the impact of the, the period of the Enlightenment on cities. Um, I don't know about you, but I find it peculiar that arguably the most influential treatise on urbanism of the 20th century, this book, has sun, space, and greenery on the cover. No buildings. Right? Amazing. 
Now, um, the question was how then to, like, like every organization or every ism that comes about, there aren't many advantages that I, of being my age, but one of them is that you have lived through enough isms so that you are automatically skeptical of the next ism that comes along, whatever it may be, right? When I first heard the term landscape urbanism, I said, what the heck is this? And uh, I got the book, and I read a book, and then I heard Stan Allen give a presentation. Um, and I came to the conclusion that landscape urban urbanism is what happens when architects encounter landscape architecture for the first time in reality, right? That it's really landscape architecture. And that the last real landscape urbanism project to be built was the Back Bay in Boston by Olmsted and Vaux in the 1870s, the Emerald Necklace, the Fenway. Um, so um, groups of architects organized by nationality uh, formed an organization called the Congress of International Architect Modern, and uh, they boarded a ship uh, this was a particularly difficult time in Europe. It was at the, in the decade prior to World War II. Um, they boarded a ship in Marseille and sailed um, to Patras in Greece. Um, and um, the, uh, they brought all these architects together to actually uh, produce a treatise on the principles of the modern city. This came to be known as the Athens Charter. And uh, the man you see with the glasses here is an historian named Siegfried Gideon, who wrote a very influential book called Space, Time, and Architecture, um, and taught at Harvard for many, many, many years. Um, they then uh, held an exhibit in August of 1933, titled The Functional City, um, at the National Polytechnic of Athens. The boards were separated into seven categories of metropolises, cities of administration, ports, industrial cities, pleasure cities, and cities of diverse function, whatever that might be, which is probably every city <laughs> has diverse function. Only um, Van Estrin's plan for Amsterdam had any scientific data whatsoever to support the plan. Uh, none of the other plans had anything to support them other than the designs themselves. Gideon, later an influential architectural historian at Harvard and author of Space, Time, and Architecture, had argued unsuccessfully that the entire Congress had to agree on both the core principles and the examples illustrated by the plans. Uh, nonetheless, this was bound together with a series of principles, core principles, um, and was published as the Athens Charter in 1943, in the middle of World War II. So its primary impact really was in the immediate post-war period, both in the period of rebuilding European cities that had been devastated by the war, and, uh, and also in American cities that were beginning to undergo transformations due to so-called plans of urban renewal and freeway construction and other kinds of things. Um, now, the Athens Charter is an interesting document because it is written manifesto style. What do I mean by a manifesto? Well, it's great because you don't have to support it with anything. You don't need any footnotes. You just kind of, you know, these principles are self-evident somehow, right? made manifest. It's a manifesto. And uh, so they wrote this manifesto, and uh, it would probably become one of the most influential documents. Um, the emphasis here was on housing, particular social, particularly social housing. There was a housing shortage at the end of World War II, uh, particularly in Northern Europe. England had been bombed. Um, had lost a, the East End of, of, of London, had been devastated. And uh, for hygiene, buildings should be built along uh, transportation routes. Solar exposure should be required on all four sides. 
kind of hard to do. Uh, modern building techniques should be used to construct high apartment buildings in spaces as widely apart as possible to free the ground for large green parks. Um, so the, the assumption here is that the, this is a statement of axioms. In other words, they can't really be argued with. And I just want to give you a taste of this, only one, principle 27, core principle 27, the alignment of dwellings along transportation routes must be prohibited. That is to say, the streets of our cities have disparate purposes. They accommodate the most dissimilar traffic loads and must lend themselves to the walking pace of pedestrians as well as to the driving and intermittent shopping, stopping of rapid public transport vehicles such as buses, trams, and to even greater speeds of trucks and private automobiles. The sidewalks were created to avoid traffic accidents in the days of the horse and only then after the introduction of the carriage. Today they are absurdly ineffective now that mechanized speeds have introduced a real menace of death onto the streets. The present day city opens its countless front doors into this menace and its countless windows onto the noise, dust, and noxious gases produced by the heavy mechanized traffic flow. The state of things demands radical change. The speed of the pedestrian, some three miles an hour, and the mechanized speeds of 30 to 60 miles an hour must be separated. Now, notice what that, that's, a, that's the critical statement. Separate the pedestrian from the automobile. Sidewalks are ineffective. In other words, common sense, forget common sense, it's not enough. What we shall do is we shall separate the street from the pedestrian. So the only purpose of the street then is what? Take the human beings off of it walking. What's it left for? Automobiles, trucks, trams, buses. So um, habitation will be removed from mechanized speeds, which shall be channeled into a separate roadbed, while the pedestrian will have paths and promenades reserved for him or her. Um, this is actually the Congress of International Architect Moderne, or CIEM, CM. And there we see Le Corbusier and his disciples. Um, kind of looks like the Last Supper or something, doesn't it? Um, they're all sort of very happy to be there, you know, in the presence of a great man and uh, signing their names to this manifesto. Well, the influence of this simply cannot be underestimated. There were entire generations of architects um, who were influenced by this, taught by many of these people. And um, then there were, there was the sort of the two, the twin events of the Great Depression of the 1930s combined with World War II. And sort of digging out from under that, a lot of rebuilding of cities. And of course, um, there was um, an immediate possibility of a test bed in which these, because of that, the, that these principles could be um, fleshed out, constructed. Uh, one of those events, um, and combined with all of this, was a sort of, um, for lack of a better term, I will call it a romantic attachment to the future. Okay, this, this great optimistic future that would come into being uh, which would make the world better. There's a tendency uh, of, of all, of every, each generation, I think, particularly when you're about your age, uh, to imagine that you and your colleagues will discover the next great ism or the next great um, principle that will guide, uh, make the world better I think that's a healthy thing, um, but I would caution you that um, it needs to be tempered by experience to some degree. Um, how many of you read The Great Gatsby? Okay. Do you remember uh, Daisy Buchanan's great yellow car, and on the weekends they would drive from the tip of Long Island and the Hamptons into the city? and they would pass through the Garden of Ashes. This was the garbage dump of the city of New York that burned for 
50 years, right? Constantly was burning. It's the site of old City Field where the Mets played, or actually prior to City Field, it was the Shea Stadium. And that was built, um, the, the Robert Moses, who was the Baron Georges Eugene Osman of New York, um, actually had cleaned up the Garden of Ashes um, and had built the World's Fair called Century of Progress um, in 1939, um, in which there were these exhibits of a very, very optimistic future. The uh, most widely attended of these exhibitions was the General Motors Pavilion, which uh, had uh, theater-like seats looking at a giant model of a future city, uh, which was laid out according to the principles of, of the CIM, with uh, pedestrians separated on elevated streets, uh, automobiles moving um, at very rapid speeds, uh, no stop signs, you would you just constant flow. And we actually see it. And of course, people were astonished. Now, the reach of CIM was pretty broad. Uh, this is a book that I purchased in 1968. Um, it was published by the University of Moscow, a group of architecture professors, called The Ideal Communist City. Remember that the old Soviet Union lost 20 million people during World War II. 20 million people died in World War II. I mean, the devastation of that war, particularly in what is now Russia, uh, just cannot be overstated. The, the book is interesting at a number of levels. The first is how it goes about condemning Le Corbusier, um, Gideon, all of these people as sort of uh, bourgeois, you know, capitalists, and then um, turns around and proposes exactly what they had proposed as the uh, ideal communist city, you know. This is uh, Warsaw, 1968, double-loaded corridor buildings set down in big, green, open spaces. Meanwhile, back across the Atlantic, there was a group in New York called the New York Regional Plan Association. They had no direct relationship to the CIM, and, um, but their goals were similar, and that is they were trying to come up with theories and principles to be applied to the remaking of cities and the reshaping of cities to make them safer, to make them more humane, to provide more parks and green space for children to play, etc. cetera. Um, and they proposed a whole series of, um, of, of sort of hypothetical uh, suburbs that um, would take this basic grid that we see here and then break it up and recombine it in a different way uh, to produce a better, presumably, a better outcome. Um, typically, they would take the blocks of New York and then consolidate four blocks of a city into a single block, such as the one we see at the top, uh, which would then open up the interior of the block for playgrounds and other kinds of green spaces that children could play in, moving all the automobiles to the perimeter. Right? This is uh, Clarence Stein's plan in 1923 for a hypothetical subdivision plan. It doesn't have a name. That was actually what it was called, hypothetical subdivision plan. And in the United States, at least in the United States, this was every bit as influential as CIM. Um, now, one of the members of the New York Regional Plan Association was a sociologist named Clarence Perry. I'm going to write that down. Clarence Perry, who had uh, hypothesized something that he called the neighborhood unit. 
that cities should be organized around neighborhood units. What was a neighborhood unit? Well, it had a population limit. At the core of the neighborhood would be a school and a park. The school would be built into a park. There would be a certain number of, of, of retail services and other kinds of things associated with it. Um, the organization of cities into these communities and neighborhoods and so forth um, is very old, at least as old as Augustus Caesar, who organized Rome into a series of these regions, or into Paris, where we had the organization of, by arrondissement, um, each one with a police station and so forth uh, associated uh, in the Marie, yeah, a sort of sub um, political unit within each of the neighborhoods or communities uh, of the city. Um, so this is actually Stein, Clarence Stein and Henry Wright plan for the hypothetical suburb in Queens, New York, which was based upon Clarence Perry's concept of the neighborhood unit. Um, ultimately, for the New York Housing Corporation, that built uh, publicly subsidized housing uh, in New York. Uh, there was a, built in 1924, the first of these to actually be constructed. It was called Sunnyside, it's in Queens, uh, constructed in 1924. There you see the part of a block with an inner court and three courts opening off the street built in uh, 1927. Here we see it. This is called Sunnyside Gardens. Stein and Wright. This is what it looked like. Okay. Um, what does that look like to you? Publicly assisted housing, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's essentially where this had the greatest traction because uh, it wasn't subject to market forces. Right? Um, the inner court, 1926, 27, photograph taken in 1949. I always got tickled at this because I felt like they must have advertised for tenants saying wanted exhibitionists to move into um, Sunnyside Gardens, where you would sort of sit out, you know, and be observed by everybody. Of course, the idea was the kids did not have to cross the street to get to the park. Okay? That was the goal. This is what it actually looks like today. Well, where did this come from? Well, it came from the head of the New York Regional Plan Association, a lawyer named Herbert Emmerich. And uh, Emmerich, um, just look at the drawing. He was obviously not an architect. <laughs> and he had proposed consolidating these four blocks and creating a community um, called Safety Hurst. I love these names, Safety Hurst. Names reveal a lot about intentions, I think. And something, and tell us something about the intrinsic nature of the thing itself. Um, Although he had joined in many of the discussions, was thoroughly conversant with the experience of Sunnyside, he called his super block Safety Hurst, a highly theoretical residence district free from traffic and congestion, which will doubtless be built someday when we tire of auto risks. Well, he turned it over, of course, to Stein and Wright, and the architects got a hold of it and kind of cleaned it up, and it came out looking like this. This would soon become the basis in 1929 for the plan for Radburn, New Jersey, which I would argue is probably the single most influential subdivision plan done in the 20th century in the United States. Um, the core of the Radburn plan was the cul-de-sac. Now, the term cul-de-sac um, actually refers to the diverticulum in the intestine these little sort of cul-de-sacs. 
And in Paris, in the 19th century, they were the alleys that allowed you to access the interior of the block for service, so that you could take out the garbage from a restaurant and service toilets and do other kinds of things. Uh, they seized upon this as a device that would then allow pedestrians, in fact, to be separated out into a pedestrian zone and um, automobiles to be confined to this auto court, which came off of a street called a motorway. They cited, Stein and Wright cited the Olmsted and Vaux plan for Central Park um, as the precedent for separating routes for vehicles, horses, pedestrians, and outside traffic at the south end of Central Park. These are illustrations from the book that they wrote, published in 1957, which was my textbook when I was an undergraduate, taking a course in subdivision design. We had to do it this way or you got an F. Um, and these are showing very happy children um, going to the park um, or on their way from home from school um, because they did not have to cross the street. In fact, there was a tunnel under the street that allowed you to completely separate the pedestrian from, um, from the automobile. So here we have it then in a, you know, in a larger assembly, each one of these cul-de-sacs. These were called local roads, and they fed into what were called distributor streets. The distributor streets fed into larger streets that were called collector streets. Collector streets fed into larger streets called arterial streets. Notice the, bodil the bodily metaphors, right? Or arteries, right? The, the lungs of the city or the parks and so on. Um, sort of anamorphic, I guess, um, kinds of metaphors here. And there you see the house was turned around so that you entered, the garage was on the back, of course, and you entered the house from here if you were coming in from this side through the kitchen. And on this side, you, you would enter through the front door uh, in these duplex units. So the living room is over here with the front porch. And then this is the pedestrian street, which is really not much more than a pathway, as you see on the left. And this was terribly confusing to the post office, which I think is the origin of the po post office losing money, right? They couldn't figure out what side of the house to put the mailbox on. <laughs> uh, how do you deliver the mail here? Or if I'm driving to your house for dinner, you know, uh, and I park over here, I have to then come out, walk down, come around, find the right one, come up the path and ring the doorbell unless I want to come through the kitchen, which is sort of the working part of the house, the more private part of the house. This was worked out in great detail, uh, sectional drawing with dimensions of exactly how wide, how big, uh, these things were to be. And um, where do you think the children played here? In the parks? Or out here in the motor court where uh, the mothers could watch from the kitchen window? That's where the children played. Where do you think the clothes were hung in the days before electric dryers? out here in the front yard, right? Because it was out of the way of everything. This is what it looked like in 1946. It's today a very desirable place to live outside of New York, um, but not without its various problems. Now, um, if you recall, I mentioned that when Olmsted and Vaux designed Riverside, Illinois in 1869, that set the prototype for all American planned suburbs until 1929, when it was overturned by Radburn. 
right? This became the um, dominant type, and every planned suburb subdivision built um, since then is either one or the other or a hybrid of the two. Um, Ninety-five percent of them are. Um, embedded within Radburn was Clarence Perry's uh, neighborhood unit, 160 acres. That is conveniently exactly one quarter of a section in the National Land Ordinance, which is where that size came from. The idea is that you would have at the core a park and a school, and then you would have these uh, local and collector and distributor streets, and then pedestrian access to the park and the school from the housing serviced by these cul-de-sacs. When you assemble all of this together, you then had uh, a central park and um, these fingers of green with these underpasses that we saw earlier, and then coming down here into the central business district. There you see the circles of a quarter mile radius or half mile radius. This was unsupported, again, manifesto style. Um, you needed to have all these services within one half mile because people walk one half mile. There is absolutely no empirical evidence for that whatsoever. Um, it is simply something which was repeated so many times that it became sort of um, common wisdom, right? You'll see this in a lot of new urbanist schemes and other schemes today, this half mile pedestrian radius. So the whole plan looks something like this. Now if we deconstruct this, what we see is that the core of the plan are the parks and the school, the school being the black building that we see there. So you add the school in, then you have the housing being fed by these local roads. The local roads are then connected up to distributor roads, which are connected up to collector streets, which are connected up to arterial streets. Now, one sign of something's influence is the extent to which it becomes common practice. So if you open up a subdivision regulation anywhere in the United States, you will see all of the streets in any subdivision regulation being classified by these terms, arterial, collector, distributor, local. Fulton County, Georgia, where we are now, does not use the term distributor. It uses collector A and collector B, the difference being that you have to, like a game of bridge, you have to declare uh, your land use before you can actually um, decide whether it is to be designed as a collector A or as a collector B. But um, every street is retroactively then reassigned uh, one of these terms. I like to poke fun at my colleagues in transportation planning and civil engineering and city planning by asking a ridiculous question. Is Pennsylvania Avenue an arterial or a collector? Pennsylvania Avenue, what does Pennsylvania Avenue do? It connects the Capitol building to the White House, the legislative branch of government to the executive branch of government, right? Uh, so is its purpose to be classified by traffic capacity and design speed? Or is it to give a palpable place in the world for two institutions of government? Okay. It's the latter. Um, in fact, if we tease that out, the larger point is that in this classification, if I want to build an avenue, I can't. Now, I can name it an avenue, but I have to classify it as one of these types of streets, local, collector, arterial, etc. So if we look then at the street pattern, what we see is this dendritic pattern, 
which are following a hierarchy of traffic flow, traffic capacity and speed. Matt? Uh, traffic capacity. Not the number of lanes or lane width. The standard width is usually 11 feet, although DOT is backing off of that a little bit now, allowing 10 foot, 6 inch, 10 foot, 4 inch lanes um, in what they call context sensitive design. But um, if we go back to our pre Islamic um, Arabic cities with our dendritic streets, where the streets follow the flow of water, what we have here are streets that are following metaphorically the flow of traffic. And this is how the space of flow, these things which kind of have their own logic um, based upon the physics of the actual thing, um, actually move into um, these metaphors become, um, take on a reality in practice. Um, So this is what Radburn then looks like. And overlaid on top of that was zoning. Um, residential areas, commercial areas, institutional areas. Zoning technically is the regulation of private property. So there is no zone called public park. Follow me? By definition. That's part of that constitutional frame, right? There's a view of it. There it is as it was built out. It came along in 1929. The stock market crashed. It was never fully completed, but its influence was extremely wide, broad. There's an aerial view of it today. And views of these motor courts that we see here, combined with these pedestrian paths opening up into these parks, community swimming pool. And then somewhere down in here would be a tunnel that would take you under that, I guess, collector street. In the 1930s, with the advent of um, a number of um, a number of um, with the, the, the actually Techwood Homes down here, which no longer exist, was the first foray of the federal government into publicly subsidized housing in the United States, and um, a series of these were built usually with the name Green in it somewhere, since Green was good. Green Belt, Green Brook, Green Hills, and then Baldwin Hills Village, Green Belt, Maryland. There we see it before the trees grew. Green Belt had um, what often gets the credit for the world's first automobile shopping center where parking is moved to the perimeter, and then you have a pedestrian mall where you're free to move about without having to cross traffic lanes. View of it in the 19, late 1940s. There it is today, aerial photograph. Greenbrook, New Jersey. Green Hills, Wisconsin. And then finally, Baldwin Hills. I'm fascinated by Baldwin Hills because of the grain of the development, which is extremely large, extremely coarse. There you see it in aerial, a Google Earth image. Okay, we are running out of time, so I'm going to have to advance this rapidly. Probably the, what's the expression, something, something on steroids? I would say that Radburn on steroids becomes Milton Keynes' new town. The influence of the New York Regional Plan Association was not simply in the United States. It also extended particularly to England, uh, where it was very influential in the development of new towns um, in the 
decade, uh, second decade following World War II, Milton Keynes' uh, Newtown, which um, is a series of these super blocks, each one with its own separated land uses and functions, with um, the most confusing place I have ever driven through because you can't see any buildings. The only thing you can see are the street signs. So if you are here, if you're here and you're sort of trying to pick up a quart of milk on the way to your friend's house, um, you have to actually read very carefully these green signs, like freeway signs, that tell you, you know, where to go. It's almost medieval. Now, if we contrast this or compare this to um, Ville Radius, um, what we see is not as much difference as we might think. That what we actually have is something where there are certain things they agree on. One is the interior of the block is cleared out for green space. Interior of the block is cleared out for green space. We have these very large blocks, super blocks, hierarchy of traffic, in this case little cul-de-sacs, entering into what Le Corbusier called auto ports, which were parking decks. The goal is flowers for all, the elimination of slums. All of this is laid down then in this book towards New Towns for America. And the impact, all you have to do is take a flight to the West Coast and look out the window to see the impact of this across the American landscape. Almost done. Okay. All right. Not just there, this is actually Rome, Italy. Beijing. And then this, finally, the Metropolitan Atlanta Planning Commission Master Plan of 1954, showing today to traffic is on residential streets, tomorrow new traffic ways and quiet homes, present conditions, the improved neighborhood involves Dead ending these streets into cul de sacs, inserting parks and schools in the middle of the block, so on and so forth. And the Radburn plan is actually cited here in the plan of 1954. Um, so this was the plan for Atlanta, 1954. Be careful what you wish for. It's more or less what happened. Okay, we have another class coming in. I have run long, so I am going to call this lecture to an end. Disconnect everything, and I will see you on Friday, okay?